Coming up on Doctype, does your website look like a tacky tie-dyed shirt? We'll fix things up with some color theory. Then, we'll look at different ways to declare event listeners in jQuery. So put on your party hat and break out the birthday cake because it's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is made possible by the Front End Design Conference and GoDaddy. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that thinks JavaScript is a decaf latte, or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding, Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the internet. All right, so this episode, we have a lot of stuff to talk about. So we're just going to skip the riffraff, and I'm going to talk about color theory. And I'll be talking about event delegation using jQuery. All right, let's get right into it. Color theory is a subject that's not always very well understood, but it has a tremendous amount of impact on the web. We're going to explore a few concepts you can use when choosing colors for your web pages. There are two ways of mixing color. When you were learning how to finger paint, you probably mixed red, blue, and yellow together and saw that they made sort of a brownish black color. When you witness the mixture of paint or pigment, it is called subtractive color mixing. You're basically starting out with a bright white and then absorbing certain wavelengths of light. So for example, the CMYK color model is a subtractive model, which is why it's commonly used in print work. Conversely, when your computer monitor combines red, green, and blue light in the RGB color model, it is known as additive color mixing. The combination of the three colors creates white because you're increasing the amount of light reflected rather than absorbing it with pigments. You've probably seen a color wheel before, and you may have even used one. Here are a few ways you can intelligently combine color in your web pages and anywhere else. A monochromatic color scheme consists of several different shades of the same hue. In other words, you pick a base color and adjust the brightness level to create other colors. These color schemes can feel very stable and authoritative, but they can sometimes lack excitement. When a color scheme has several colors that are adjacent to one another on the color wheel, the color scheme is said to be analogous. Analogous colors are often found in nature and as such can be very pleasing to the eye. Yellow, green, and blue is one example where the green hue is the base color and yellow and blue are the analogous colors. Complementary colors are two colors that are opposite one another on the color wheel. The most common examples of this are purple and yellow, red and green, and blue and orange. Complementary colors are very common because they are visually exciting. When you put two complementary colors side by side with a hard edge between them, they can be so visually unstable that they appear to vibrate. Once you're looking for complementary colors, you'll start to see them everywhere. There are many other color schemes that I didn't cover, but if you want to explore more, I have highly recommend you check out Cooler at cooler.adobe.com and play with the color wheel there. Throughout the 20th century, people tried to link colors to subjective ideas. For example, one might say blue is very strong and masculine, while red is very passionate. This didn't really work, one reason being that colors mean different things across different cultures. A better approach is to think about the context in which your colors will be seen and then pick a color scheme based on that. When using color in your web designs, you need to decide on the audience. If you're designing a corporate website, for example, you'll probably want to use a monochromatic color scheme because of its visual stability. On the other hand, if you're designing a website that needs to capture the short attention span of the typical website visitor, or if you're designing a web application that will be used by people on a daily basis, an analogous color scheme would be a good choice. It generates enough visual interest to keep the eye moving, but not so much that it's hard to look at for extended periods of time. Finally, if you're creating a marketing website for a sports team or a restaurant that needs maximum visual flair, it's hard to beat a solid complementary color scheme. This keeps the eye moving through pages rapidly and generates a lot of visual excitement. When looking for color schemes, you might use a tool like Cooler, you might go outside and explore the natural world, or you might look in your closet and just pick out your favorite t-shirt. Inspiration is all around us. Now when we come back, Jim is going to tell us about event delegation in jQuery. If you're a web person, you're going to want to check out the Front End Design Conference. It's a one-day design conference in beautiful St. Petersburg, Florida on July 22nd. There are seven amazing speakers that will be covering a wide range of front-end design topics. There's even a cool after party and a whole weekend of mad geekery. Jim and I attended last year and it was a blast. Head on over to frontendconf.com and get your ticket. Early bird tickets are just $99 and only $129 later on. We hope to see you at the Front End Design Conference. 
jQuery gives us a few options for attaching event listeners to elements. Understanding the differences between them can save you hours of frustration and even make your page more responsive. Using jQuery, it's very easy to add event listeners to one or more elements on our page. We can simply build a jQuery collection using the dollar function with a CSS selector and then use the bind method. The bind method takes a type of event and a listener function that will be called when the event is performed on one of your elements. In addition to the bind method, jQuery provides several methods like click, hover, and key down that act as shortcuts for calling bind with the first argument of click, hover, and so on. When you have elements on your page that are added and removed after the initial event binding takes place, you may notice that your event listeners don't work as you expected. This is because when you call bind, jQuery goes to each one of the elements it can find and attaches your event listener directly to those elements. If you add more elements later, even if they matched your original query, they won't have the listeners attached to them, so your code will seem to break. If you want your event listeners to work on elements that are dynamically added to the page afterwards, then the live method is what you want to use. The live method works a lot like the bind method. You pass it a type of event you want to listen for and a function to call when the event is fired. The difference is live will call your event listener for any element that matches your selector, not just the ones that were on the page when you set it up. This is made possible by the way events bubble. In episode five, we looked at how events bubble from an element to its parent, to its parent, all the way up to the body of the page. When we call live, instead of attaching your listener to each individual element, jQuery adds a special listener to the body of the document that listens for all events on the page. It looks at each event created on the page and determines if the original target matches the selector you used to define your live listener. If it does, then it executes your listener, otherwise it ignores it. This can create quite a performance hit because jQuery has to look at all the events from all the elements on your page to find the relevant ones that you're looking for. In versions of jQuery before 1.4, not all events were supported in live because some browsers don't allow those events to bubble. In jQuery 1.4 and later, pretty much all events are supported due to some clever code written by the jQuery team. jQuery 1.4 introduces the delegate method, which is a lot like the live method, but a bit more specific. Instead of listening for events on the whole page, it looks at events in a particular element, allowing child elements to be added and removed and work like they do when you use the live method. Let's look at an example. Here we call the delegate method on our table with class users. We pass another selector string to it, and this means that any element inside of our table that matches the a.alert will trigger our listener. So what jQuery does is add its special live listener to the table element, and anytime an event bubbles up to the table from the children inside of itself, it sees if the event came from an a tag with the alert class, and if so, it calls our listener. We can add more rows to our table, and it will continue to work since they will still bubble up to that same table. Now, if we add a new table with the class users, it will not work since that magic listener will not have been attached to it. The rule with delegate is you want to attach it to the deepest element that you can that will not be dynamically added to the page. So in my example, the table rows will be added and removed, but the table stays the same. So it's a great use case for the delegate method. So jQuery gives us three ways to attach event listeners to elements. Bind is ideal unless you're gonna be adding elements to the page dynamically. Live pretty much always gets the job done, and Delegate works a lot like Live, but in a more targeted and efficient manner. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you gonna go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctype.tv from? So we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you gonna use? Enter the code Doctype3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com that's it for this week be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype tv on twitter and if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of doctype send us an email at questions at doctype.tv and if you subscribe via itunes or rss you'll never miss an episode of doctype so until next tuesday remember that every great web page starts with doctype